Hello, 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 and welcome to a roundup of Synapse News. That's right. So this is a fairly new thing we're doing on the channel. I've been doing a monthly roundup of Databricks news for quite some time because they very handily publish all of their release notes and I can just move through. Very recently, the Synapse team have started doing the same thing. So we can now go on a monthly basis and just take a look at any new additions into the Azure Synapse Analytics platform and say, what's that? What's that? Oh, that's useful. What does that do? Why have they done that? All that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the plan going forward. So we'll have a little Databricks roundup, a little Synapse roundup. And today I want to do the roundup of all the news for December 2021. That's where we are now. Insane. And we'll talk through what that means. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe and all of that good stuff. Say hello down in the comments. Let me know what you think of some of these new features. Now, annoyingly, I can't show you all of them. So we can talk through it. We can have a bit of a chat about what it means and where we think it's going. We might have to wait until some later videos to actually get some hands on and dig through the tech. It shouldn't be too long a video. We'll see how it goes. All right. So with that, let's dive straight in. OK, so this is what we've got now. So lovely chap Serene Reddy has put out a monthly update. So you can just have a quick Google for Synapse Updates December and you'll find this little blog which has all of the different things that are happening in the Synapse space. So that should now be your one-stop shop. Anything new on the platform, go check this out, and that should be the link to all the docs. Again, there are the other places. You can go look at notifications inside Synapse itself. You can have a look at the different roundup of technical blogs. I'm hoping, going forwards, this is the place we can go just to collect everything together. I'll pop a link to this down in the description so you've got it to hand. Okay, so what have we got? First thing, they are just saying, here's a link. This Synapse monthly updates, just actually keep hold of that. And then you'll be able to come back to this page and get each of the monthly ones as they go. So very, very useful. Okay, first actual feature. So when you've got um, Synapse notebooks, so when we're dealing with the Spark pools uh, engine inside Synapse, previously there was only a limited uh, different types of export that you could do. So you can now do it in HTML, Python, thankfully, and Latex. No, use Latex. <laughs> okay, so we can have a look inside here. If we've got just a notebook knocking around, and just grab one of our training notebooks, and we can go, we can right click, and we've now got all these different options about how to export it. So the actual Jupyter notebook format uh, used to be the default. Um, weirdly, it's a different format to how it's actually stored when it's inside uh, the Git repo. So the Git repo objects for your notebooks are all in the Synapse JSON format, which is very weird. But now we can just say, I would like a Python file, please. It'll give me an error saying you're trying to download Python. This could be something dodgy. Click OK, open it, and there we go. I get normal Python notebook style exports. Whenever you've got magic commands, whenever you've got markdown, that is just put in on the cells, but it does just export it as a big load of Python, which is so much easier to work with. So great, really easy, super, super easy to work with. You can now export things on mass. No, 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 that's not true. You can export things by right clicking on it. You can't export things on mass. I'm trying to click on a folder and say export whole folder of stuff. It give me uh, no. So next, please, would be to be able to do that same thing and say, I would like to export every notebook in this folder in this format. And then it'd be much easier to move things around and export things and play around with stuff. But now at least just the ability to export it in some nicer format just makes a lot of sense. So good, nice, straightforward, easy. Uh, next up, so inside a notebook, when you've returned some data, uh, you have the handy little button inside a Synapse notebook saying, I want to display this data. I want to make this, show me it as a bar chart, as a, a column chart, as an area chart, as a pie chart, because we all love pie charts. Um, and quite simply, there's three new visuals being added into that library. So we can now do box plots, we can do histograms, we can do a pivot table. So if you're having a play around with your data and you just want to have a play with it inside that notebook, you don't want to save it down, expose it as a table, open it in Power BI and actually do some stuff. You just want to work directly and just go, what does that look like? What does that look like? You've now got a few things baked in. Now, I mean, I'd love it eventually if it just used the Power BI visualizations and you could just do it directly in the notebook. But I think I, I, we're not there yet. <laughs> that's, that's not a thing. Uh, I've, I've no idea if that's the plan. I would love it if it was the eventual plan, but we'll actually see. So there you go, three new types of viz you can go and have a look at inside your notebooks specifically. Find one, it's my favorite one. Um, so 
The way Spark Pools works in Synapse is a little bit funky. When you open up a notebook, that notebook needs its own Spark session. It needs a private Spark session allocated to its own executors, and that is what you work with. Now, so many times, I've just been, I've been doing a lot of stuff in SQL, and I've been like going, right, okay, I'm going to do my notebook, and I hit F5, and that refreshes my browser, and it goes, do you want to refresh? And I'm like, what? Uh, yeah, okay. And if you do, you lose that Spark session, which means you then have to spin up a new Spark session. You have to wait for that Spark session to start, that means on a Spark pool, it's going to allocate new executors. I need to wait for those VMs to start. The Spark pool might not have enough capacity to allow for that extra session, and you'll get told no, and you have to go find the original session, turn it off, and it's painful. Now we've got this button. So if you happen to disconnect, if you have a network blip, if you accidentally close your browser, uh, you can go back and say, oh, look, there's already a session associated to me, to this notebook. Just keep that session keep working in that existing session. Uh, and that's going to make life a hell of a lot easier um, when developing notebooks inside Synapse directly. So yes, awesome, really, really good. This still makes me sad. So each notebook still needs a separate session. So if you're working inside Synapse and you've got one notebook open, you start your session, you wait for your Spark cluster to start up, you start doing some stuff and you go, right, okay, I'm going to call another notebook and I'm going to do this next part. You have to then wait for another Spark um, session and um, underlying executors to start on your Spark pool before you can work with that. So to do to work in multiple tabs still needs separate sessions. But at least now you can refresh your browser without losing your state and having to start from scratch and having to <laughs> wait for a new Spark session to start up. So that is really really good. So that is an awesome awesome thing that has uh, yeah, it's been a been a long time coming. Okay, so they are they are the Spark updates. So. Oh, nothing crazy. It's December. Everyone's on holiday. It's fine. So additional exports, some additional visualizations, and the ability to reconnect to a session. Nice. There's loads more things and actually some really, really cool features over on the integration side, largely to do with mapping data flows. So mapping data flows is that visual drag and drop GUI uh, type thing we can do that used to be part of, well, it still is part of uh, Data Factory. But it's if you actually want to do some data transformation, as part of Data Factory, and you don't want to step out into another tool such as Spark, such as writing store procs, such as using sys packages, um, then mapping data flows gives you that graphical thing which uses Spark underneath the hood to then transform and manipulate data for you. That's already part of Synapse, that's just uh, part of things, but we're getting more tools and features to make it a little bit richer. So number one is this map data tool, and I, I don't have access to this yet, I cannot see this yet. But in the new style of lake database, that's when we have a lake database and we've said, I would like a, a new database, a new lake database, and this is new preview features. And then this gives it this whole database designer thing that we can go and we can create tables and say, I would like a, my, I don't know, my product table. I can go and add columns to it. So I can say, well, this is going to be my primary key. PK. It's a table design, right? So I can go out, save that. I can choose where it lives in my lake. I can make it so it's Parquet, not Delta yet, but I can still at least use uh, Parquet for it. So you can do all of that. And then there's a button that's meant to be there that I don't have yet, which is allowing you to map data to it. Now this is essentially using mapping data flows. So we can say in here, the stepping through the, the docs that we've got, I can go onto my custom table that I can map data to it. I can then say, this is where I want to map data from create the mapping saying this is how these two things should actually associate to each other. And it allows me to do some of the things that I've got inside mapping data flows. Essentially, you're building your target table, you're designing your target table inside that database designer element. And then you're saying, this is how to get data into that target table. You're basically building pipeline and the underlying uh, data flow to populate that system. Now, so that's like sort of a big, big thing when we've got, if we've got a lot of engineering, we've got a lot of automated cleansing and we're getting the data into the lake, we're picking up, we're cleaning it, we're automating, that's all very engineering-y. If we've got some business users, some data analysts, some um, people building out like warehouse kind of use, and then they've designed their data model and they're like, right, I need to go from that curated cleansed data that my engineers have produced into this data model that I'm trying to do, it's that stitching together. Is that how do I actually want to transform that into that? And they can build out those mapping data flows to do it with some of these tools. 
So that sounds really awesome, but I do not have access to it yet. So I cannot actually go and have a play. It's in public preview, it should be there. I just can't see it anywhere. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, next one. Uh, so quick reuse of Spark clusters. So this is still in mapping data flows, because as I said, mapping data flows under the hood just uses Spark for you. Whenever you're dragging and dropping things, it's essentially writing Spark code for you under the hood. Now, what used to happen is if you had several mapping data flows in a row, each one would start its own Spark cluster. So doing that would take a couple of minutes to start up its cluster, do it, turn it off, next one, oh, start a cluster, do it, carry on. Um, so this is essentially using the time to live, saying actually, if you've just done something using a Spark cluster underneath a mapping data flow, just leave it turned on for a few minutes. And then if I've got a next mapping data flow in a chain of events inside an integration pipeline, it's just going to reuse that Spark cluster. So you're not going to have that couple of minutes delay in between each and every time you're dipping into a mapping data flow, it's going to be able to reuse it. That quick reuse is really, really good. It doesn't allow you to run several things in parallel on the same cluster. So each thing will still need its own session the same way we saw with notebooks. But at least it is allowing us to do that much quicker thing. If you've got a load of data flows chained up, you can use them more effectively in sequence. So very good. Um, We've got a new transformation type going into mapping data flows. That's that exter external call transformation. So essentially, if you wanted to run something on a row by row basis, and you know, as soon as you say that, you go, oh, is that going to perform that well? But it is for some scenarios do come up where you have to do that. So the external call allows you to step into something like a REST API. So we can actually say, well, actually, for each row I've got in here, I want to go and use a REST source, so I've actually created a linked service. I've got a REST source set up. You can do it in line. You can do it as a full, um, full linked service kind of style. Go and call that REST service for each row. Now you need to be a little bit careful with that, right? So if I had a million rows going through this and I wanted to call that web service a million times, that might have some kind of throughput bottlenecking on whatever API source I'm actually using. But if you're doing it for a slightly smaller set, so if you're trying to call maybe a local uh, ML model, and you wanted to score data going through your mapping data flow, you can do that kind of thing. So, obviously, pinch your start in terms of scalability and how you want to set that up. There's some complexity in terms of how you manage the this association of those two. But as a thing, just saying, call this web service, map the parameters in, map these columns in, retrieve the JSON object output, actually a very, very powerful tool to have in your arsenal using mapping data flows. So some interesting stuff in terms of how that works. I mean, they do talk about other things going in, so SQL store procs. So for each row in this data set that going through my mapping data flow, call a separate proc and pass in some of the values from that row as parameters. Again, some really interesting use cases you could start to get used to on the Citizen EDL kind of thing for people using mapping data flows. So interesting stuff of how we can actually sort of, uh, start to use that and how we can fit that into the rest of our pipelines. So, interesting. New. Mm. Uh, and the other one, final thing is flowlets. Flowlets are a, a brand new thing. So, again, inside mapping data flows, if we have some common transformations, if there's like a set pattern that we use every single time that we're doing things, uh, I want to go, well, I just want to use that lots. Kind of just like take that and reuse it. That's what a flowlet is. So it's a little bit like kind of, uh, having just these generic little templates, except that rather than the template being for the whole mapping data flow, it's for a set of transactions, a set of actions um, inside that particular flow that you can then reuse across a load of stuff. Again, really, really, really interesting. Just again, just making it, making more code reusable, making things like a little bit just easier to use. Uh, so we can go, you can go and create them as these flowlets. You can design them as these things that kind of plug in and then parameterize it and see how it works. Again, looks just like any other mapping data flow, except you're building this component of your flow rather than an entirely separate flow itself. So definitely, definitely an interesting concept. I've not had a dig through using them in anger yet. So it'd be interesting to see actually sort of uh, what the limitations are, what we can do with it, what we can't do with it. Um, but certainly just, we should hopefully be seeing some far, far better coding practices Coding, low coding practices, is that, is that even a thing? Uh, going into mapping data flows in terms of some of the things that you can now do. Whereas we used to see lots of things where you'd have essentially like massive pipeline of transformations and just copied and pasted so many times because 
you couldn't quite parameterize it enough to be able to have one generic mapping data flow. This will allow us to say, well, actually, I want that bit to be generic. And then essentially just have multiple wrappers around that generic flowlet. So definitely an interesting concept. Really nice to see more investment and more new things going into mapping data flows on the Citizen ETL side of things. And having those things, as well as having the mapping into um, the lake designer parts, uh, doesn't look like flowlets are currently compatible with that, but I'm hoping in the future, anything you'll be able to do in mapping data flows, you'll be able to use to map data into that lake database design. And then, yeah, that's a really cool story for actually allowing people to do their curated zones, allowing people to have a generic engineered kind of flow of data, acquiring data into a central managed part of the lake, and then having this splintering out of people who actually are in the data domains, building out their data products, using these low code tools to actually get there and curate the data themselves. And the more stuff we see going into that, the more powerful this becomes. So super interesting stuff. And that's it. There isn't a huge amount of stuff in today. Again, really interesting stuff going into mapping data flows, a few quality of life things on this Synapse Spark side of things. And yeah, interesting stuff going in. Now, the one actually thing I'm a little bit, little bit annoyed about is all of these things not yet seen in our updates page. So if you're in the Synapse workspace, you can always go and just have a look at this to say what's, what's currently gone into our release notes. And I don't see any in there currently. So all these nice things that have gone into this release page not yet seeing reflected there. So be a little bit careful about where you're getting your Synapse news from. Still a little bit disjointed. Wag a finger at the Synapse team until they actually get those two in sync. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, keep an eye on this release page. Keep an eye on this each month. And I'm hoping we'll see this consistently going forwards. This nice centralized place of where to go to find out your Synapse news in the future. Obviously, you do also have the option, option of just coming in and talking to me, and I'll just talk about Synapse each month and tell you what's gone on and what I think about it. But usually best to make your own opinions up. So go and have a look at that yourself as well. And that is it for today. I will, again, be digging into some of these stuff in the new year. I want to kind of try and work out some of these demos, try and get access to it, have a little play with mapping some data out. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments what you think of these things, any of these bits you've been waiting for. What do you think of flowlets? What do you think of mapping data into your leg designer? Is that going to change things dramatically for you? Anything you wanted to see that you don't see? You're like, where's that? I was expecting that. What's going on? Let me know down in the comments and we can see where we go from there. Alrighty, till next time. Cheers.